Welcome to the Creative Coast's video podcast featuring Savannah's top thinkers, business people, innovators, and creators with host B. Ray, director of the Creative Coast and program director Sharice Bennett. What follows are interviews running on the Creative Coast's website this month. You can check out the podcast day or night at blog.thecreativecoast.org. Hello, I'm B. Ray with the Creative Coast, and today we're chatting it up with Susan Isaacs of Paragon Design Group. Welcome, Susan. Thank you for having me. We're delighted to have you. So tell me, you run a fabulous company. I, that's true. I run Paragon Design Group. We are a multidisciplined uh, firm here in Savannah that combines web strategy, design development with animation, brand development, and print design. And how long has Paragon been around? We have been around since 2001, so going on 12 years. And you got started because? Um, kind of an interesting story. So when I was at SCAD, I had fellow students that I collaborated with all the time and all of us had the same problem which was that we were going to be graduating and there, were n there was nowhere for us to work in Savannah. And really we were trained to put together portfolios and then leave for the big city. And Savannah has sort of cast a spell on us so we were really interested in what opportunities there would be for us here. We were too dumb at the time to realize that you don't just start a company if you can't find a job <laughs> with no plan in place. That's what we did, um, but it worked out. <laughs> we're still here all of these years later, and we're really glad we stayed. We've, we've been witness to an incredible transformation of the city of Savannah over that time. So could you take a minute and describe Savannah 11 years ago and describe Savannah now? In Why don't I describe Savannah in 1996 when I first came here? Okay. When Please. I came here, sight and scene, the city is beautiful, obviously. But there were things that were startling to me because I came from the Caribbean and I was coming to the U.S. to go to school and so you have a certain perception of what a U.S. city looks like. Well, my first week here, I went down to Broughton Street just exploring and it was terrifying. I, it was in the daytime and the windows were boarded up and there were guys peddling stuff off of bicycles and it was pretty scary. Um, and that's because, you know, Savannah went through a period of decline and was really just sort of starting to reemerge. Um, over time, I've watched not just the storefronts come back to life, but certainly for me, what's been really important is watching all of these companies like ours, you know, blossom and, and spring out of nothing. So when we started our company, we didn't even have competitors we could point to. And so, it's been pretty fantastic to watch a community of technologists and designers and just really smart, interesting people, um, some from Savannah, lots from other places who come here because they love the city as well. Uh, to me, that's been the most exciting thing. And you founded Paragon with other students from SCAD? Yes. I founded the company with Andrew Davies and Philip Joyner, who were from different feels at SCAD, but we, um, we had a great friendship, which still exists today. Isn't that a wonderful accomplishment? Yes. So I've been to your office, and I, it's a beautiful place, and about where you enter, there's a, a whole slew of trophies or awards, or tell me what those are. Um, well, we've won a few awards over, over the years. Um, I'm very proud of the work that my team does. I can't really take credit for the final output on things because I'm not really the designer or the developer or the animator working on any of those, but we've won quite a number of tele awards, which are the sort of national television um, awards. Um, we've gotten a few Webby honorees, which I'm very proud of. Those are very, very hard to get. Um, we've won lots of Addies, and we've won a lot. <laughs> I'll just say that. You know, I, you know this having met me, that I, I believe the proof is in the pudding, it's in the work. And the accolades are nice, but they aren't really, they don't really tell the story about um, how we treat people, the impact we have. And so that's, that's the part that we focus on more than the awards, although the awards are shiny, like you saw, <laughs> and we put them out so people see them. Wonderful. So um, all, your three partners have stayed here, and yes. your 
company has continued to grow. Yes. So what do you see for the next few years? Well, we actually are, we have lots of exciting things in the works right now. I can't talk about them <laughs> because they are top secret. Uh, but we, you know, we've been very fortunate in that we have, I was actually trying to put a number to this yesterday. We've worked with probably over 450 clients wow. in the last 12 years. We're a small team. We're only at six people right now. And we, we're high output. We work really intensely. We have a good time too, <laughs> but it's a, it's a very intense environment, I think. Um, you know, we've seen industry change over time as well. And so one of the nice things about the, the close-knit team that we have is we're very like-minded, very curious people. And so we're evolving as our industries are evolving. When we started, print was a big deal. Right. Web was not. I mean, it was very hard to get someone to, to agree to build a website for their company because what was that and why would I ever need that? And now we're in an era where everybody's on a smartphone and trying to you know, access information that way. And so a lot of the changes that we've gone through have been really in response to what's happening in our industry. And then a lot of the things that um, we have in the works are a combination of the changes in our industry, but then also we're very fortunate to be able to work with bigger clients, you know, the longer we've been in business. And so we're getting to sort of hone what we do to fit those types of clients because, as I've learned, the bigger the clients, the harder the challenge is, and, and, um, and we're pretty excited about the things that are coming up. That's a very Great. big answer, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to it. So, uh, how many of your clients are from this area? Um, I would say about 30 or 40%. 30 or 40%, and yes. the other range from what geographic? pretty much all over the US. We, we've done some international work as well and look to do more of that in the future. Um, but, you know, the nice thing obviously about local clients, local being Savannah, is that we get a lot more face time with, right. with folks like that. And, and, you know, it's nice to work with people who are part of your community. But then a vast majority of our clients are people we've never actually met in person. Oh. So we, on the phone, or we Skype, or um, you know, obviously we have all of these tools that make that possible now, but um, it's kind of neat because every once in a while you'll get the opportunity to finally put a face right. to a client, somebody you've had, you know, a relationship with for years, and that's kind of a So a how do they discovery. find you? Um, we are essentially a referral-based company. So our clients like us enough, <laughs> thankfully, that they refer us to to uh, their clients and, and, um, and their colleagues. And so um, we've also been fortunate in that people that we work with, when they move you know, through the corporate world, they sort of take us with them. And that's, right. been a, that's been a great source of opportunity for us. Wonderful. So you've been a wonderful supporter and very involved in the Creative Coast. We're so thankful for that. Is there, um, what motivated you to be so helpful? Well, as I said earlier, when we started, Savannah was a very different place. Uh, we struggled, you know, a lot at the beginning, partly because we didn't really know what we were doing, right. but we were also in a town, none of us are from here, so we didn't have a lot of connections, and we were working in an environment where there really wasn't an appreciation or understanding of what we were doing. So there were a couple ad agencies, but web agencies, <laughs> what was that? Um, and so we, it sort of felt like we were on an isolated island in the Pacific somewhere because we not only were we struggling to get access to potential clients, when we met those people, we had a hard time getting them to really understand what it is we were offering and why that wasn't, you know, valuable. And I remember meeting with a consultant early on um, and she told us, it was encouraging and discouraging at the same time, but she told us, you know, you have a hard challenge in this town because you first have to educate people about these things before you can even sell them. And so that was the world we were in, it was overwhelming. And then in 2004, I met this crazy gentleman named Chris Miller who was working on this idea for the Creative Coast Initiative. And that was sort of someone, like someone coming into a room and turning a light bulb on. It was the first time I'd actually met someone who like heard what I was saying and I didn't have to explain myself 
and um, Chris introduced us to everybody he knew and he was a great cheerleader and a champion and it made all the difference. One of the very first contacts we made through Chris is a company, so that's in 2004, that we have an ongoing relationship with to this day. We do a lot of work with them. And so what that did for me, it's, that saved us. And I haven't forgotten that. But what it did is it instilled in me this sort of sense of responsibility to pay it forward. So I believe you always leave something better than you found it. And so for us, this idea of creating the world that we wish we had when we started is really important. And so whether it's giving time to startups or to the Creative Coast, because this organization is really serving that community, you know, we're happy to do it. Well, and I'm happy job. to do it. Thank, well, thank you, you so much. So I'm Bea Ray with the Creative Coast, and this is Susan Isaacs with Paragon Design Group. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Hello, I'm B. Ray with the Creative Coast, and today we have Kathleen Fritz from Creative Builder. Welcome, yeah. Kathleen. Oh, thank you. I think for having me today. I'm so happy to see you. Tell us about Cre Creative. Creative Builder is a um, it's a lesson building tool that helps educators incorporate creativity into lesson planning, specifically for project based learning. And what type of educators? Well, we're looking at kind of education across the lifespan. So right now our current tool, what they call an MVP, or Minimum Viable Product, we're focusing on um, K through 12 as well as um, universities. And what we're looking at is providing access to design thinking. Um, and the best place to start is with education, so you can create lifelong learners and lifelong implementers of design thinking and innovation. And so how, what has the response been so far with some of the people you're sharing the ideas with? Uh, we've been sharing the ideas with a number of educators, both um, public school teachers, charter school teachers, um, administrators, as well as um, education um, professionals that are working more on the university level who are doing research in education. And what we're finding is that there is a real um, need for this kind of training for teachers because I think a lot of things are kind of handed to teachers like, oh, you know, go find, do something innovative for the science fair, right? Um, and it's, you know, nine o'clock at night and Sunday night, and you're, you're still looking through all of the different, you know, websites, and you're trying to incorporate the new technology and all the iPads that you've bought. And so what we're trying to do is create something that, um, what the teachers see really being helpful is creating something that helps them to deliver something, which is the lesson plan, which is kind of the lifeblood of a teacher. Um, and also coaching them within to understand how do you use this design thinking that so many different firms have been promoting in education. And so Creative Builder, the idea for it got started where? Uh, the idea started um, in India during a Fulbright that I did um, to, to both uh, Bangalore and Tamil Nadu in India. And I was uh, teaching at a school called Shrishti School of Art Design Technology. And I worked with a series of design students on the problem, you know, how do you deliver art integrated learning to non-artists or non-art teachers? And so we worked with a nonprofit called Communities Rising, and they're based out of Pennsylvania, and they basically work with uh, the Dalit community, which is what you would call the untouchable community um, in Tamil Nadu, just outside of Pondicherry. And what we were looking to do is that they run an after-school program, and what the after-school program does is it delivers um, English, literacy, um, mathematics, and computer science to third, fourth, and fifth graders. And in India, it's becoming kind of similar. Here in India, they, they do education where it's a lot of rote memorization, a lot of citing, reciting back. And so the teachers are looking for these skills. And so these are very young teachers. And what we're doing is we're, we brought art integrated learning into uh, these different lesson plans. So being able to look at how does bookmaking or telling a story actually help with English literacy. So you could go and look at the culture of maybe a festival and you could, or you could look at observing like how a bug lives their life and write a story about it. You learn not only the skill of bookmaking but also the skill of writing and as well as drawing. So what was it like to be a Fulbright? Fulbright is an amazing experience. Um, I was there for six months and I've gone back since then to do um, training uh, last year. And the wonderful thing about doing Fulbright is the community that gets built around uh, the Fulbright program. 
and especially in India, it's one of the largest programs that the State Department has in conjunction with, uh, the, with the Indian government, and so it's 50-50 funded. So we had, I think in our year, we had about, um, I think 170 Fulbrighters between, uh, I was doing teaching and research, um, there were researchers and teachers as well as there were students who were graduate students there doing postdocs and people who were doing, teaching English as a second language. So there's a really great, um, there's a really great support system that's, that's really built there and just wonderful people who are working in education and creativity in India. It's, it's quite happening there. Wonderful. And how long have you been in Savannah? Um, I've been in Savannah, let's see, I've been in Savannah for, um, it'll be six years in August. Um, I came here as a uh, professor of interior design at Savannah College of Art and Design. And I worked there um, until I left for the Fulbright. And some of the work that I did there besides interior design was doing this sort of how do you solve larger problems and working on a more interdisciplinary um, scope with a number of other professors in the School of Design as well as School of Communications. Um, and then while I've been here, I helped with co-founding Emergent Structures with Scott Boylston um, back in 2009. And we were looking at, you know, very similar issues like, you know, it's how do you solve these big problems, right? Or what they call, you know. Um, so it's kind of been a theme for me is solving these larger problems about how do we innovate instead of dying, right? And when did you wake up and say, I'm an entrepreneur? Oh gosh. Um, I think I woke up and said I was an entrepreneur when I was about eight years old. Okay. And um, my friends and I used to put on, we used to do anything to make money. And we would do things like sell lemonade on the golf course, or we would end up, um, or we would throw magic shows and charge money, or carnivals for the neighborhood. Of course, our parents sort of fronted all of this, but we kept the money for ourselves. <laughs> Did you have a favorite magic trick? Uh, Cards? The carnivals were a lot more fun, and I really liked what we used to do is we, do, used, to do, we used to take the cakewalk and make it a cupcake walk. And that was probably my, my favorite thing to do, because okay. <laughs> it's a combination of making cakes and then, you know. So you're really right back in a school system, right? It kind of feels that way, yeah, pretty much. It's all about having fun and happy learning. Yeah. And where was this that you grew up? I grew up in uh, Simsbury, Connecticut, uh, up in, it's up and then sure. just outside of Hartford. So, yeah, kind of on the foothills of the Berkshires. And what do you see in the future for Create and Builder? What do I see in the future? Um, Create and Builder, what we're looking to do is, you know, our goal is to how do you bring creativity to everybody, or as to many people, and Create and Builder stands for creativity to many. Um, and it came out of the Atom Project, which is art to many. And so our goal is to make this as accessible as possible. So uh, right now we're, we're talking with a lot of different people, um, trying to part looking at partnering with some schools and doing some pilot projects um, and helping them with documenting their project-based learning and being able to uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of, of this kind of um, work with students in order to help make their creativity a lot more direct. You're making a big, you're making a lot of progress and mm -hmm. creativity in schools. I thank you um, for making that progress. I'm B. Ray with the Creative Coast, and we have Kathleen Fritz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm B. Ray. I'm with the Creative Coast, and today I'm here with Fred Brown of Brown's Guides. Welcome, Fred. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So delighted. Tell me about Brown's Guides. Brown's Guides has been around for 30 years, doing books and magazines and all sorts of projects. Uh, uh, we were delighted to have the internet come along. We jumped all over it because the internet really is, um, I think it was made for guidebooks. Uh, in, the print, in the print world on guidebooks, uh, you're limited by space. Uh, everything, as soon as you print a book, it's out of date, it's gone. And with the internet, it's always fresh, and it's inexpensive, and it's quick. So the internet and the website is really made for the guidebook publishing business, and we're glad to be in it. Wonderful. And what got you started in the guidebook publishing business? You know, I, I've just always enjoyed these things. Uh, all the, uh, I've always been an amateur at it. I'm always an amateur hiker or canoeist or kayakist or mountain climber or whatever it is. But, uh, and we write from that perspective really from for people who who uh, are are learning or uh, experiencing these types of things for the first time so. 
And tell me about, you have some guidebooks for Savannah, for this area. We've written about Savannah for 30 years, and uh, we have done historical walking tours. Um, uh, of course, all of the, uh, the barrier islands, the, uh, the, the uh, Georgia coast, we've written about that for years. And do you have a favorite area that you like to visit personally? You know, I, the whole uh, coast, all the barrier islands, uh, it'd be hard to pick the favorite, I, I would say, but, uh, but the ones that don't have a ferry to them are my favorite, <laughs> Sapelo and Blackbeard, that kind of, that kind of experience. Wonderful. So talk to me about, you've thought at some point about locating in Savannah? We, we are, we're ready to expand into other states. It's been a Georgia and Southeastern publication. We're ready to, to, to put Brown's Guide in other states and we would love to find a way to base that expansion uh, in Savannah. It, it, being in Savannah would have lots of advantages. We'd have better access to the coast, to Florida, South Carolina, up in North Carolina, the whole, the whole eastern coast. And, and it would also give us a lot in common with other coastal areas, even if, it was, if it's New England or if it's California or wherever it might be. Coastal areas are the best recreation areas, more activity, more things to do. Plus, Savannah is a brand. Uh, from, from, a, from the standpoint of uh, tourism, people, it's, it's one of the most important tourism cities in America. And we'd like to be a part of that, and we'd like to help promote it. And I think with a, with a national website, which uh, we're, that's the direction we're headed in, I think we could, we could be a part of that. Wonderful. And through the years, you've had some interesting people that have written a forward or parts of your books. Tell me about that process. Well, uh, yeah, some of them, uh, uh, Bill Cutler, I still get, he's been dead for years, but I still get calls asking about Bill Cutler. Natalie Dupree wrote her first uh, biscuit story for, uh, for Brown's Guides. Uh, Russ Reimer went on to edit uh, Mother Jones magazine. So we have served as a uh, starting place for a lot of writers that have gone on to uh, build a national reputation and, and do a great job. So I'm, I'm texting pride in that. So. so you've been in some ways a trainer and then in other ways you've been a forum for other people who might already be famous but they've come in and they've uh, contributed. Is that correct? That's true. Uh, Terry Kay, Pat Conroy, uh, uh, others, uh, Ann River Siddons, all of those were have been Brown's God's friends over the years. It, it, it serves as a, as a good place for these kinds of writers to, to air out some things that they may not be able to write about in their, in their books. So you've mentioned Pat, Pat Conroy, Bridgeless Islands. I uh, spent six years on Tefusky Island. That, that's, that was a great treat, I'm sure. That's <laughs> a wonderful spot, yeah. Very blessed. So tell me what kinds of things are you enjoying this week in Savannah? Well, I really have come down to talk to Curtis and meet with Curtis and, and plot our strategy for uh, taking this into, into uh, other states. So we're, we're ready to move out with this. What about mobile technology, travel, mobile technology? What's, what's on the horizon? Well, you know, uh, I'm, I really am kind of relying on Curtis for that. We have not done a lot with, with mobile, but <clears throat> I think that's a huge potential for us because I, I, Obviously, people are traveling with their with their phones, and they're, if you can have access, some of the tours that we've done over the years, very um, detailed driving tours, walking tours, where you really talk to people and see things in in depth. I think that's ideal for a mobile device, where you can really have that with you and read as you go along, and 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 uh, and really find out what you're looking at. We've We've done that pretty well over the years in print, and uh, transferring it to the internet, transferring it to mobile, I think, can be real, real powerful. I'm excited about that. And you're talking about Curtis Faircloth has been helping you with Brown's Gazette, right? Brown's Guides. Right. He's been he's been a good uh, good counsel, and we we're uh, looking forward to working together in Savannah. So. Wonderful. Any connection with the Girl Scouts? Any overlap? Have you worked with them? No, not really. That would be that would be interesting to explore. That wouldn't it? Well, some of the things you talked about from hiking and 
I'm sure they would benefit. For sure, yeah. So that sounds great. One of my favorite things being in town is seeing the troops and asking them where <laughs> they've come from. I and I know uh, it'd be neat to see them have one of your guides. Yeah. So I'm B. Ray. We're at the Creative Coast and enjoying speaking with Fred Brown. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you very much.